Okay, now we're going to talk about databases, uh, kind of key terms and ideas involved in them. Uh, the other video for the week will talk about uh, data types and a little bit more uh, definitions and things. First of all, databases, uh, what are they? It's a collection of data. It would kind of make sense from the name. They're commonly abbreviated as DBs. Um, and they're typically organized in tables. You can think of each table as the as kind of like a spreadsheet workbook. Each table uh, ideally will only contain a particular type of data on a particular topic, but we'll be covering that more in a second. Basically, it uses relationships between the tables to connect data. The idea is that you sort of limit the replication of data as much as possible. But again, talk about that more in a second. Uh, there is a movement towards non-relational databases, but that's really out of scope here because that's a, a really groundbreaking thing. Um, it's seeing a lot of use in like big data and like Google uses something similar to that because managing the relationships between tables takes a lot of resources. And so when you're dealing with massive data sets, and I'm talking trillions and trillions of records, um, relational databases are kind of too slow. So the ideas behind a database is that um, it's a way to store data and make it easy to retrieve. So the idea came about basically because as computers became more commonplace and started to be used to manage things like finances and what have you, it's necessary to be able to manage these resources easily and quickly. So like I said, you can kind of think of it like a giant spreadsheet with multiple workbooks and multiple sheets serving as storage receptacles for information. Um, each row of data is supposed to contain unique data and each table is supposed to contain specific information about a particular topic. So each workbook has specific information, each row has unique data. Um, if you're thinking of a database as a combination of spreadsheets and code is a pretty good metaphor because that's essentially what they are. Normalization and flat tables is kind of the that's kind of the big theory in database design. Uh, one of the main ideas is that you should data should never be stored in more than one place. So you have one table that'll hold student names, one table that'll hold their grades, one table that'll hold class descriptions and IDs, you know, one table that holds sort of medical information. Um, usually that kind of separation is impractical. So it's kind of there are different levels of normalization and you shoot for kind of the best one you can get so basically something to, a way to think about this is which is better storing the information about comp 101 with the student information or in a table that holds sort of class information let's hold that idea in our heads as we move on so think of the students at Channel Islands. Each one has an ID. It's your, you know, student ID or Impel ID if you work there. This is because there might be more than one person with the same name. You might be thinking, well, I have a pretty unique name. That probably won't happen. But my name is really unique, and there's at least one other Drew Clinkenbeard. Um, so it's not really that rare of an occurrence. Uh, actually, he's my cousin, and he lives in Oregon the last time I checked, which was quite a while ago. So each student at Channel Islands takes more than one class, typically. And so each class has an ID, students have IDs, and these IDs need to be unique. So you end up with, right there, you have at least two tables, one holding information about the class, its title, its description, its category, that's like computer, sci you know, computer science, the comp, um, its class number, 101, and its sort of its section number, 18 in our case, and then there's the number you use at registration, and all these things kind of serve as identifiers or IDs. So let's look more at the organization. So I've been talking about student tables. You can see here, this is the title, and this is the key, this is the ID. This would be your, you know, number, your, you know, it's a couple of zeros and some digits. First name, last name, date of birth, phone number. You also have classes. In this case, it's a simplified table. It just has class number, title, description, and effective date. This is something specific to PeopleSoft and Oracle. I'm including it here because it's a, a force of habit. Um, you can basically think of it as, say you have multiple versions of a class, or you have a class that's only supposed to be available at a certain time. You think of it like, you know, some classes only run in the fall semester. You can effective date it in the future so it'll show up in the future but that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves and so as you know students earn grades in classes so those have to be somewhere else now there has to be a way of linking these things and as you're looking at these you can probably see how that happens 
Right, so you can kind of see that in student, you have a student ID, and that's included in the grade table. In class, you have a class number, and that's also included in grade table. So basically what this is saying is this student that was in this class got this grade. So then you can look things up. If you know who this student is, you can say, give me all of the results from grade where student ID is equal to this. And then you can kind of link them. You can get this name and link it to this grade and get this class title or description. So to cover that a little bit more in depth, the IDs in the particular table are called the primary key. So if you're looking at a table like the student table, and it has a unique identifier like the student ID, that's its primary key. Now, primary key structure is kind of a big topic and really out of scope for this. It, ideally, it's something like this. It's a unique ID that's generated per record. Sometimes some places do weird things where they do aggregate information where it'd be like first name, last name, and a date. I, I don't like those. They're messy. When you take that primary key and you put it in another table as a reference, that's known as a foreign key. The easiest way to keep those straight is you can think, you know, if I were to go visit another country, say I went to Italy, I'd be a foreigner in Italy. So this student ID visiting this table is a foreigner, so it's the foreign key. And the primary key, you can think of it as it's sort of the primary identifier, the first identifier of that information. It's what uniquely identifies that piece of info. So information, like it says in the slide, information used to link other tables is known as a foreign key. And the ID, sort of the primary unique identifier in its own table, is known as the primary key. A primary key is used to uniquely identify information in a table. Foreign keys are used to link tables to each other, i.e. form a relationship. That's kind of where a relational database comes from. Once you get the information in the database, how do you retrieve it? Well, that's by asking questions called queries. It's known as, shock of shocks, querying the database. For this, we need a specific language that's structured to make use of this database and allow us to make queries. In a rare batch of insight and clarity, it's actually called Structured Query Language, or SQL. You may hear people call this SQL. That's wrong. It's not SQL. SQL refers to something else. Specifically, this should be SQL. It's something different. About 40% of us will actually call it SQL. Everybody else calls it SQL. So, by common usage, I guess they're right, but that galls me. Anyway, like any good language, there are dialects of SQL. Every company that implements a database uses their own flavor of SQL. So Microsoft has MS SQL. There's MySQL, which is what I'm most used to. There's Postgres SQL. There's Oracle's PLS SQL. There's, uh, which actually I think is called SQL. There's transactional SQL. There's all kinds of things. So most of the changes, most of the things they add in are procedural control flow structures, basically the ifs and loops that we talked about last week. So this is kind of what SQL looks like. You basically say select what you're going to select and where you want to get it from. So here we're using the star, which is the wildcard character that basically says give us everything. And this would give us all of these results. And I'm going to post another video that actually demonstrates what these queries look like. Then this one says select star from CS student and provides a pseudonym, uh, sort of a shortcut for that table so you don't have to type out CS underscore student every time, where the student ID from that table is equal to 3. And this brings up the dot notation that we saw last week and just sort of brushed over. This is a very common notation in computer science. It's basically you have sort of the originating item and then the thing that's contained in it, and that's separated out by a dot. And then this is an even more complex query. It's basically selecting the last name and the first name from the student table that's here, where the student ID is 3. Here's an even more complicated query. Here we're picking the last name, the first name, the grade from the grade table, and the title from the, the, and the, title from the class table. As you can see, from CS student, or CS grade, CS class, and I'm using these pseudonyms. It's where the student ID from grade equals the student ID from student. Now one thing that trips me up a lot 
is in SQL, they use the single single equal for comparison. That's unlike pretty much every other programming language. One thing that SQL introduces that we haven't really seen are these sort of Boolean operators. It's You have and and you have or. You can basically think of it as if you have an and, it says I want everything that meets the first criteria as well as the second criteria. If you have an or, it's basically saying I want either one. So and is more restrictive and or is more forgiving. It's more open. And lastly, we have this order by student last name. So that essentially is just going to sort them by last name. So this is a program called MySQL Workbench. It's provided by formerly MySQL, now Oracle, since they bought them. And I set up a database because I wanted to demonstrate some of this stuff for you. So that's actually what I'm going to do here. Let's try this one. Select star from CS student. So if we come back here, we already have, well, let's just type it out. And you can see this, just like the programming example, uses the semicolon to end a line. So we'll go ahead and execute that, and you can see this shows the results from that select statement. It gives us the student ID number, the first name, last name, date of birth, and the phone number. And you can kind of see over here, if you look at the tables, you can see in columns, this is the student structure, the, the structure of that table. Now let's try this one. Select star from CS student where student ID equals three. So if we come back here, we can see I'm just going to, I'm actually going to clear out some of this. Let's just actually start over. So if we go select everything from CS student that I'm going to call STDNT, I'm going to organize this a little bit where stdnt.stu id equals three put quotes around that there and if we run this we see we get this one result for frank castle here we see peter griffin and now i can show you an example of or if I put in where student ID equals 4 or student ID equals 2, I should get both of these results just like that. We get Jane Doe and Peter Griffin. So if we change this to 1 and 5, see we get Barbara Gordon and Katniss Everdeen. So what about this one? So let's get this one entered in there and see how that looks. So this one we're selecting their last name, first name, and well, we'll leave the or structure that we've written. And we see we just get these two results not the whole thing. Now this is starting to get a little bit complicated but uh, SQL has, or MySQL rather, see I told you I was going to do it, has features where you can use functions similar to what we use in a spreadsheet to do things like concatenating items so we can put these values into one field and then we can call them something else and it allows us to sort of tailor the information that we get out of the database. This comes in really handy when you connect it to something like Excel, or if you want to generate a report, uh, you can really tailor your data to show what you want it to show. So rather than coming out looking kind of like a mess, where you have, you have something like this, and you run it and you get all this information sort of kind of jumbled around, maybe you don't want all of that. This allows you to sort of tailor what your results look like. So speaking of tailoring what our results look like, let's have a look at this last query here. This one's kind of a monster. Well, it's not really, but if it's the first time you've seen SQL, it's a little bit daunting. So let's actually put that in here. There, now we have kind of a listing of the title of the class the students took what their grade was and it's ordered by their last name. So we see Frank Castle did pretty well, Jane Doe also did well, Katniss did surprisingly well, Barbara Gordon did not as well as you might think, and Peter Griffin did honestly surprisingly much better than I would have ever given him credit for. So here we can see this is another sort of query that is kind of complicated but it's basically picking every student and calculating their GPA. It may seem kind of simple, but this is actually something that people do for a living. So it's just something to know. And 
working with SQL can be fun and exciting because it's a little bit like a puzzle and it's it's very logic driven where you have to figure out how can I combine these things to get the result I want in a reasonable amount of time.